And in this part, I wanted to show something that was shared by Global Vision. Excellent channel. We've reviewed many of his videos. And here he was sharing something on April 27th of this year. Red Mercury, Fake or Key to Free Energy, Part 1. And very fascinating. I thought I would just show you a few things that jumped out at me. And of course, Global Vision talks about Mercury being a function in a lot of this ornamentation that we see on the top of cathedrals and really all the buildings, all the buildings, the domes along with the spires and the little balls on the very top of the spires and domes filled with mercury and oftentimes coated in gold and having some sort of function, some electrical function perhaps free energy, perhaps healing, uh, perhaps defense mechanisms. Exactly what? Uncertain. But definitely this mercury, along with these metals, having some role in what seems like technology of the ancient world, of the old world. And I've never really heard of this red mercury. This is new to me. And I did do a little bit of research after this video, which I'll share with you. But from my understanding, this red mercury is found in thermometers. And in the case of this old television, as we can see here, this looks like some kind of uh, 1970s or 80s portable television. And red mercury appears to be used as the antenna. And here he takes it apart, and we can see down here that he pulls out this little tube here, and it has red mercury. And I did show a video once translating a Russian documentary showing the power of mercury and its ability to enhance the reception of antennas. And so now here in this old school television, we see this red mercury being used in perhaps the same way to enhance the reception of this small portable television. Very interesting. I'd love to hear your comments on this red mercury. Then he tears apart another kind of apparatus and after peeling away the insulation we see again red mercury and he snips the wires and now I'm going to show you the applications of this red mercury. First of all, it shuts down cell phones upon a close proximity. And next, what was really interesting is that it has the ability to repel garlic, or garlic repels it. So it doesn't seem to like garlic. For some reason, they produce a counter force to each other and very interesting he shows many examples but this one here was very fascinating what he does is he sets up a mirror and I'll leave the link to this video and here he sets up a mirror behind it and he drops the red mercury on it and first of all the red mercury does not have a reflection very interesting and here he's pointing out like a vampire's blood and how a vampire is not supposed to have a reflection as if it's some kind of a metaphor for this and so a it's garlic repels this thing again similar to a vampire and he moves the garlic around kind of chasing the mercury around the plate completely repelled like an anti-magnetic effect secondly we don't see the reflection of this in the background as you can see here in the tiny little window and very strange that something could actually have the ability to not show up in a mirror very fascinating and he does several experiments all very low budget but very transparent he lifts up the mirror, shows us the plate, sets different objects around it, really doing his best to do a nice controlled 
study, but in every case, no reflection, repelled by garlic, and attracted to gold. And very fascinating, here we can see at the beginning of the video, and more so in part two, how this red mercury just seems to cling to gold. And very interesting, I was showing this to a friend and I was explaining that, you know, just these forces, just this red mercury being attracted to a gold, and now you could create some kind of a device to generate some sort of a charge. And his thoughts were that you could also use this to perhaps harvest gold or trace amounts of gold in rivers. And he thought of just setting this red mercury at the river bottom and pulling it up periodically, cleaning it off, and dropping it back in again. And really, I wanted to keep this little segment under five minutes, but let me just show you this red mercury. Here's what it looks like, the crystals of a mercury sulfide. And it said that these are also used to create nuclear weapons. And some people also claim that it's a hoax, of course. Very interesting. A fascinating story here, almost turning into this conspiratorial element, a fictional chemical substance. So very interesting. I want to dive into this a little more, but for now I'll leave it there. So in this little burst, we're going to check out Canada's Grand Railway Hotels. Now I've been showing this Chateau Frontenac here in Quebec, Canada absolutely mind-blowing and I read a little bit of this story in a past video and just blew me away to consider that a railway company along with the arduous task of building a railway had time to throw up amazing and glorious castle-like hotels all along this rail system spanning from coast to coast and these are no Motel 6s or Holiday Inns. These are nothing short of the most amazing buildings found anywhere, today and yesterday. So again, I started out with this chateau, and pretty soon I had a flood of comments coming in, prompting me to look at more of these hotels along the rail lines. And so today we're just going to see what we can see. Many of these hotels were built in the Chateau style, or Chateau-esque, which is a result that became known as a distinct Canadian form of architecture. Very interesting. And in later years they departed from the Chateau style and went for an Italian look, unlike any previous Canadian railway hotel. And here we can see the Hotel Vancouver, built in 1916. Another absolute beauty. And a little more than a railroad traveler might be expecting. Canada's first Grand Railway Hotel was the Windsor Hotel in Montreal. Opened in 1878. Closed in 1981. Here we can have a little look in 1890. Doesn't look like it was a very busy day. Not a single person out for a stroll. Beautiful cathedral here in the background. And here we can have a little look at the hotel's lobby rotunda in 1878. In the grand and fragile year of 1878. Not really sure what's going on here. Not the type of lobby for any hotel that we've ever seen. Quite a extravagant waste of money. And really looking like a saloon in its repurposed condition. Looking like they serve some ice cream here and a makeshift bar and perhaps pharmacy items. Not seeming like this was the original purpose or function of this beautiful building. The hotel was constructed between 1875 and 1878, just blasting this out. And at the time, Montreal was Canada's largest city. Again, the city of my mother's birth. 
It was built to serve visitors arriving at the nearby train station, which itself was replaced soon thereafter by Windsor Station. Here, a little look at the Windsor Station in present times. Looks like it's undergoing a little bit of renovation. Looking as if it could be up to a thousand years old. And in 1906, it succumbed a large fire that destroyed almost 100 guest rooms. But the hotel was spared. And later, they would build this third hotel in 1898. Let's have a little look at it in modern day. A real beauty. And let's look at it in the early 1900s. No shortage of pointy spires. And here a little look at the occupants of the hotel. Small horse and buggy. A little parking lot here in the front. And very important that these people had such a splendid building. We can have a little look from the gardens. And seeming very unoccupied. Amazing that they would even conceive of needing a hotel like this. But nevertheless, a true work of art. And in this time period, to build a hotel of this size makes very little sense at all. So this Canadian Pacific Railway is very busy opening hotels in the late 1800s, blazing this rail line through the rough Canadian wilderness while this Ohio Railroad Company is busy down in the south. This is pretty much what they're up to in the 1800s. 1776, America becomes a nation, and 25 years later, these people are ready to build railroads. And all of the technologies and infrastructure that go along with constructing a railroad. And really unbelievable. And yet, the writers of the narrative had to squeeze this into the timeline. They had no choice. Rails are found everywhere in abandoned states and conditions. And no matter what part of the world you're in, there are probably old rails and you wonder their origins seeming to be in disuse. And to add to this, a whole string of magnificent hotels dotted all along these rail lines. For a time period where there's no population to justify the creating of these rails nor the traveling of these rails. Times are simple back then. And when you tie this in with all the underground tunneling, subway systems, and constructing of roads, as we see in these older maps, the roads are all there as well. We really have to question whether it's even possible to not only build but engineer this entire nation within a hundred years of its inception. And now let's have a look at something else. This was shared with me in a comment someone asking me to have a look at this building in Germany a beautiful city in which I have discussed and been punished for in a past video but today I just wanted to look at this beautiful building built in 1907 and 1909 today it's simply used as an office building what else to do with it but in the past it had a very interesting designation. It was a cigarette factory, and sometimes it was referred to as the Tobacco Mosque, and really a gorgeous building. And you have to see it at night. It appears that this material is some kind of translucence, which allows light and color to illuminate this dome. And let's have a look at that. Here we go. Very beautiful and super advanced for this early time period, but of course much older than this time period that we're given. A true wonder, and I thank you for the share, and absolutely amazing that this is simply an office building. At least it must be a nice place to work. 
And here we were prompted by Slim Vickens to check out this Preston Castle in California. And truly a beauty. And totally run down, burnt out, and seeming to have gone through a lot. And no takers for the inheritance of this beautiful structure. And I thank you for the share. Very remarkable. In my distraction, I saw this, which appears to be the Nebraska State Capitol. Absolutely beautiful. This towering monstrosity of a state capitol building. Complete excess and super advanced. And here we go. 1922 to 1932. The 400 foot tower can be seen 20 miles away. 400 feet. Ooh, and here it appears that Nebraska is one of these dissatisfied inheritors. We can see their first state capital in 1870, looking a little top heavy. And we can see the bustling civilization and their modes of transport. This capital building, certainly excessive for these inhabitants. But nonetheless, the second state capital in 1912. Now this is just pretty amazing. Let's have a little look at this. 1912. Very beautiful. Very excessive. And very outdated. According to these people in 1922. In 1922, this no longer cuts it. This is no longer suitable for a state capital in 1922. Now, we need to build a new building with a 400 foot tower. We need to build this. And really mind blowing. And let's look at some construction photos if we can. Construction. Very interesting. CGI. And how about something real? No. Beautiful fountain in the courtyard. A little look at the floor in the rotunda. Very interesting. Workers lay tracks for the Capitol Railroad around the second state capital. And this baby just looking like it really has had its day. And here again, just looking at the laying of railroad tracks, maybe, at best. Look at their little shovels. These aren't even good shovels. Pretty worthless, actually. And this crew seems very enthused. These guys aren't really here to work. One would need a lot more than this manual laboring crew. And again, their small shovels. Let's see if we can't find something in a search. Is this it? I'm not sure. Seems to be. But again, with this whited out sky, completely unnatural sky, very difficult to say if this image has been manipulated. And now real quick, we're going to have a look at a man. The man's name is Bruce Price, 1845 to 1903. He's said to be the innovator of the shingle style. Here is the shingle style. He was said to be influenced by modernist architecture. He also designed Richardsonian Romanesque institutional buildings. Let's have a look at that. Here we go. A Romanesque architecture named after architect Henry Hobson Richardson back in 1838. And a little look at some examples of this type of architecture. We see an old post office in Washington, D.C. Cincinnati City Hall. The Salt Lake City and County Building. And one of the few I visited in person. And here one in Texas. 
Along with these Richardsonian Romanesque institutional buildings, he also designed mansions, skyscrapers, and chateauesque railroad stations. Yes, here we come full circle. This man of 57 years old, his best picture, not as impressive as the architecture he is attributed to leaving behind. Also attributed with this Windsor station that we looked at earlier in Montreal. He was born in Maryland. He studied for a short time at Princeton University. And after only four years of internship at a firm, he began his professional work in Baltimore. Following a brief study trip to Europe, he opened an office in Pennsylvania where he practiced from 1873 to 1876. He settles in New York. He builds a whole bunch of buildings and then dies at age 57. And here's a look at these buildings he's given credit to designing. He must have been very fond of what we call the mud flood window. Only a fool would design a building in an area where there is either a fair amount of snow or rain, unless you intend to have some sort of covering, and just absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, forget about these pictures, they, they couldn't even fit all of what this man had designed. And this is just a serious portfolio of work that just goes on and on. This really reminding me of Andrew Carnegie. And I made a video on the subject once. And it looked at not only the brief history of Andrew Carnegie and how ridiculous the story of his rise to success is, but also in the later part of his life he became a philanthropist and builds and donates thousands upon thousands of buildings. Here we can see 3,000 public libraries, and this is just public libraries. I mean, over on this side we see his Carnegie Hall, and one after another. And all of these Carnegie buildings, and as seen down here, Carnegie University, all of them repurposed buildings conveniently labeled as a Carnegie building. Everybody accepts the backstory well. And again, thousands upon thousands of redesignated buildings from the old world, all attributed to this Andrew Carnegie. Well, I guess that's it for this week. I thank you so much for joining me, and do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe.